Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll be starting the webinar shortly um, at 7.30 sharp. Um, just waiting on a couple more attendees to join us before we begin. Okay, so hello and welcome everyone to the first webinar in our Boosting Northern Beef Performance Series. My name is David and I'll be your moderator tonight. So to begin, I'd just like to go through a bit of housekeeping. Uh, those who have logged in tonight, you might be able to hear myself and also be able to see the screen, which shows my mobile number. All participants except for myself and the presenter are currently on mute, just to ensure minimal background noise. If you do wish to contact me, however, for example, if you're having a technical issue, or if you have a question, you can text or call the number on your screen or alternatively use the live chat tool, which I'll explain in the next slide. So here on this slide, you can see an image of the webinar control panel, which should be on your screen now if you're joining via the computer. If you have any questions or would like to chat with me during the session, simply click on the questions tab circled in red. This tab will then drop down and you can type your question into the area shown by the red arrow. Now, please feel free to send in any questions throughout the session. If they are urgent, I will reply immediately via chat. Otherwise, we'll save any questions about the presentation towards the end. All questions are anonymous and they only come through to me, so please don't feel shy in asking any questions if they pop up. In addition to that, if you want my attention at any time throughout the webinar, you can also click on the little hand symbol circled in green. This will alert me that you might require attention and I can find out what you need. So that's all the housekeeping down. Um, before I kick on, uh, I'd just like to find out a little bit about the audience before uh, we start the webinar. So I'm just about to launch a quick poll, which if you're on a laptop or computer, you can participate by selecting the right answer. Okay, so just launching the first question now. So what is the primary industry that you currently work in? Um, please select all that apply. All right, I'll just give it a couple more seconds. All right, I'm just about to close the poll. I'm closing now. 
All right, I'd just like to share with you. So 67% um, of the audience tonight um, are in farming. And then we've got a couple of, um, you know, 20% in veterinary medicine and animal care, and a couple of people in agriculture, agriculture retail, as well as government. All right, I'll just launch the second question before we begin. Um, so which vaccines are you currently using in your animal health program? So please select all that apply. All right, a couple more seconds. Okay, and I'll be closing the vote now. And just sharing the results again. Um, so we see 84% of um, everyone here um, are using clostridials, including lepto, so five in one and seven in one vaccines. We've also got a sizable chunk using botulism vaccines, um, as well as fibrosis, and also about 25% using pestivirus, um, and 21% using other. So thanks for participating in that. Um, I'm gonna continue on um, and introduce um, our guest speaker for tonight, so Dr. Matt Ball. Currently, Matt is a vet and owner of Beacon Veterinary up in the north coast of New South Wales. He's also the Senior Livestock Technical Services Manager at Verbac Animal Health. Um, he's got over 18 years experience helping cattle farmers in a range of clinical, advisory and research roles. And his current employment spans jobs both in clinical practice, government, as well as industry. Tonight, Dr. Matt will be leading us through the first webinar in our Boosting Northern Beef Performance Series. And we'll be talking about botulism and vaccination considerations. Thank you for joining us tonight and over to you Matt. Thank you David and good evening everyone and thank you for spending some time to learn about botulism. What I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to go through some update on research from different countries um, and also from Australia about botulism the disease and also about what we understand about vaccination. So to kick it off I'd like to first of all talk about botulism in another country and what we're looking at here is a scientific article that was written up by some scientists on a terrible botulism outbreak that occurred in Brazil. So this outbreak um, was just written up last year and it was an outbreak in feedlot cattle. There were 1,700 steers that were vaccinated at induction and unfortunately due to contamination of the silage of those cattle, 1,090 cattle died, which was well over 60%. So the first revision for us tonight is that this can be a very, very serious disease. Um, the picture which the scientists put in this journal article shows us a lot of information. We can see some cattle that are well, but as the outbreak progressed, um, the cattle on the left is starting to become paralyzed. The one in the middle is even more paralyzed. And the reality of this disease is we can see the one on the right at the front um, has died. And when we look at that, um, the scientists describe of us the classic symptoms you see with botulism. It's a disease of paralysis. So you can't move parts of the body. And here's a picture of a Bostindicus cow um, with its tongue hanging out, really classic botulism. That tongue can't come back in and that's in the early stages of botulism seen in this outbreak. The really tragic thing about this disease, what can occur is that in the cattle that became sick in this feedlot, the authors described that 99% of the cattle died. So, I mean, that's a pretty serious illness when we compare to um, coronavirus that the world is obsessed with at the moment, of course, um, this one wins. Now, in this particular outbreak, a really interesting lesson is that these cattle were actually vaccinated at induction, which we talked about on the other slide. They were given a single dose of a traditional water-based vaccine but the label says to boost that vaccine four to six weeks later, and they didn't. Um, that's probably not that uncommon for some animal health programs at induction. And it showed that with the dose of toxin that these cattle were exposed to, that single vaccine shot was inadequate to protect those animals. If we start having a think about in Australia rather than Brazil, what happens when we get botulism, in the far north of Australia, we call it an endemic region for botulism, which means that it occurs commonly and that cattle are exposed to botulism frequently. 
in this type of situation, we talk about that 20% of cattle in an outbreak could die. Um, so some cattle may have natural immunity, but 20% is still a very large number. Now it's important to think about that, that that's in an endemic area. When we talk about a non-endemic area, we mean an area typically down south where cattle are not routinely exposed to botulism and they may get this toxin in their feed, which we'll talk about more soon. Now, in those cases, the mortality rate would be like the Brazil outbreak that I started talking about, could be very, very high, above 60%, or we've even had cases in New South Wales in dairy farms where over 90% of the herd died, unfortunately, from botulism. I'm All right, gonna, I'm just gonna do a quick poll. Um, so again, I'll launch it on the screen and please select all the all that apply. So have you ever experienced an outbreak of botulism on your property before? All right, a couple more seconds. All right, and just closing the poll now. So again, I'll just share with everyone the results. So we've got 75% uh, no, 15% um, yes, and 10% unsure. So I'll give it back to Matt. Thanks, David. I mentioned that botulism is a disease of paralysis. I'd just like to explain in detail how this actually occurs. So a cow like us is made up of many, many muscle groups that allow it to move and to do all, all its functions, to breathe and to eat, etc. And so the little picture on the left is showing some of those muscles on the outside of the cow. And then we've got the inside of a leg being shown and you'll notice that there's some yellow stripes and these are the nerves. And so nerves are joined to the spinal cord and then they come down to the leg and each nerve controls muscle groups. And if we zoom in even closer, we can see in picture A, a little nerve just supplying one muscle group. Now what happens so that cattle and the same occurs in us so we can move around is electrical signals are traveling along those yellow nerves and then there's a little gap before the muscle and to jump that gap a chemical is needed to be released that you can see is in the little circles here and we call that a neurotransmitter. What happens in the disease botulism is shown as a visualization in picture B is that the toxin, the green substance, blocks that site and you're unable to get the protein passing that gap and therefore you get paralysis because the muscle can't work. And that's why you get paralysis of the limbs, the tongue and all other places in the body. So if we think about um, paralysis in the animal, um, what will you normally see? Uh, normally you will just find dead cattle, especially in Northern Australia in extensive pastoral stations. If you do see symptoms of botulism, a lot of people notice that the cattle have their legs stretched out behind them, so we call that frog-legged. Other times you may notice that the cattle have an inability to eat, they might not be breathing well, and we already mentioned about the tongue. Now this is a little video I'm going to show of a case of botulism I saw a number of years ago. It was from cattle that became exposed to other animals in the herd that were not disposed of properly and they were ashes and the cattle were attracted to that area. You can see the animal totally unable to move now. The tongue cannot be brought back into it. Um, shortly after the investigation and the diagnosis here, that animal was euthanized because there was no recovery. So to learn about the cause of botulism and understand the enemy a bit more, it's important to know that this is caused by a germ. So there are good germs in the world and there are bad germs and Clostridium botulinum is the cause of botulism is a harmful germ. It's a bacterial type of germ. So coronavirus, it's, it's a virus, it's different. Botulism is a bacteria. Um, it's a rod shaped bacteria and it has a quite a unique feature in that it forms spores. So if you look at the little circle there, the black rods is the bacteria when it's growing and multiplying. That's kind of when it's alive and, and active. And then you can see on the end of some of those black rods, you've got a little circle forming and that's the spore or the egg stage or it's the dormant stage. And then you can see that that's been separated off. 
And so that's generally how botulism is. It's a very small thing. You can see my ruler there that 50 botulism germs are going to fit on one millimetre. There are actually lots of different types of botulism organisms that scientists describe, but C and D types are what are the most important to cattle in Australia, and that's why they are the strains that are put into our vaccines. Now, botulism is actually called a clostridial disease because that's the type of germ. And tetanus is another clostridial disease that is important to northern cattle producers. In the southern cattle producers, we also have diseases such as pulpy kidney. We also have black leg and black disease and there are other clostridial diseases. This little graphic just explains how all these diseases are actually quite similar. They all have a spore stage, which is kind of the sleeping stage or the dormant stage. And this can be found almost everywhere where livestock have ever grazed in Australia, these spores. It couldn't be dormant in the soil, in the water, but also it's actually inside animals. They've eaten the spores and they're lying dormant. Now these spores hatch or become active when there's a low oxygen change. Now for botulism, this occurs when feed or other things are decaying in the environment. For tetanus, this is often in a wound or any bruising. And what happens in the low oxygen environment is those little spores become activated into real germs, as shown in this picture, multiplying. And it's those germs that produce the toxin that is harmful to the animal. All clostridial diseases in livestock can cause sudden death. Now, the vaccines that we make are actually against the toxin. Um, a lot of people get confused on that point and think that we are making a vaccine against the germ there, shown in the red, but we're actually making the vaccines against the toxin. The bacteria can still multiply in the animal, but we prevent the toxin from doing its damage, and we call that toxoids. So botulism is caused by cattle normally by them eating botulism toxin that is formed already in the environment, and that toxin can often be found in bones or decaying carcasses, it can be in contaminated feed or water, or often not known, it is also um, in decaying vegetation, so plant material. It doesn't have to be animal material. If we have a look at a graphic of some of the type of places where botulism toxin might be found, the one in the left-hand corner is by far the most common, just a dead carcass, an animal as it's decaying. Um, that can occur in watercourses when ducks, ducks can certainly die from botulism, contaminate a water source, but as I mentioned, it can also be from vegetable matter. Poultry litter has been a cause of botulism outbreaks down south when calves have certainly got into that poultry litter or if cattle are allowed to graze on pastures that poultry litter has been put on too, too recently. Now in Northern Australia, we have a specific risk factor for botulism and it's associated with low phosphorus soils. This map here from Queensland DAF shows um, the estimates are that many parts of Northern Australia are very low in phosphorus. So the link to botulism is that the idea is that if cattle are trying to chase some extra phosphorus, they will have a behavior called pica. Pica means eating things you wouldn't normally do. So it's reported that some pregnant women might eat soil from pot plants um, during certain stages of pregnancy. In cattle, pika is eating bones, they're herbivores, so eating bones or meat is not normal for them. Now, interestingly, you can't fix botulism really by um, just correcting the phosphorus because the cattle in Northern Australia still seem to display pika. So it's probably a learnt behavior from their mothers. Certainly the low phosphorus soils of Australia place a very large number of cattle at risk of botulism and needing vaccination. There are some uh, times during decades when we probably have a higher risk of botulism and people have been saying that that is now following on from some of the events that occurred last year. Um, when we have very large numbers of cattle mortalities, that will lead to increased contamination of botulism in the environment it's not possible to dispose of all those carcasses. So we can certainly have a higher risk of botulism following mass mortality events from floods and droughts. The cost of botulism to Northern Australia has been identified by Mid and Livestock Australia to be very significant. We know that from historic reports that before we had botulism vaccines, people used to get what we call black musters, a black hole in their muster when you know, where had all the cattle gone? And lots of names were 
talked about for potential reasons why cattle were dying or some of the symptoms they were seeing, and some of them were thought to be plant poisonings. But when vaccination was rolled out, many of those so-called diseases disappeared. It's because they weren't real diseases. Um, the number one threat to cattle was always botulism and we just needed a vaccine. So for that reason, vaccination has become widespread practice in Northern Australia to reduce the economic loss that is known to occur from the disease. And in Southern Australia, vaccination is certainly recommended on a risk basis, um, depending on your enterprise. Now, something that isn't talked much about botulism is that they don't all die. And I've put up a journal article title here where some scientists specifically looked at this overseas in dairy cattle, but the same would apply for beef cattle. And so the idea is that we associate outbreaks of botulism with a high death rate, but we forget a little bit about what happens to the ones that didn't die. Did they get sick for a while? How long did they take to recover? And these scientists identified that you can have some very slow chronic illness with botulism. What that means is, are there cattle out there in Northern Australia that we don't know have had botulism, but they live on? And these might be some of the cattle we see at musters that are in very poor condition and they survived botulism, but they were unable to eat for a week um, or they had other problems associated with the botulism. What I found really interesting about these scientists' research was that they were able to find a link between how healthy the animal was in terms of did it have healthy germs in its gut, so it was healthy individual, did it have adequate trace minerals, which we know are important for immune system, and they linked that to how long it took the cattle to recover from botulism if they survived. And if they were in a healthier state and had better trace mineral status, they were actually able to recover from their botulism earlier, which I found really interesting. So that leads to a concept, well, how on earth do animals manage to protect themselves against botulism, whether we help them or whether they survive themselves? And that is, of course, through what we call their immune system. It's important to have a quick look to remind ourselves or for the first time to think about how cattle and also ourselves protect ourselves from disease. And it's best to think about this as a number of layers of defence. The first layer of defence in mammals is just the barriers. So in cattle, we think their skin, their hair, same as in us. They have hooves that protect germs from the environment getting in and causing an abscess. There are some germs that they swallow and kill immediately with their stomach acid. They may get exposed to germs that can cause pneumonia, but they cough them up quickly and they remove them. Or maybe they get exposed to from flies of germs that could cause pink eye, but their tears flush them out. So this is the first line of defence and we have similar things ourselves. They're best thought of like the walls of the castle. Unfortunately, germs can get over these walls or through these walls and can get into the body. Once the germs or the toxins are into the body, we rely on what we call our non-specific immunity. These are our soldiers and cattle have these immune cells as well. They're not particularly smart to know what a particular germ is, but they're good at identifying that's foreign, that toxin or that germ should not be in the body and they try to kill it. And they also stimulate things like fever, which slow down um, the multiplication of some germs. So it's useful to think, can these things help with botulism? Well, unfortunately, no. The toxin is often preformed in the environment. It's absorbed quickly, acts quickly, and all these type of defences really don't work. It's lucky, therefore, that cattle and ourselves have other lines of defence. And an important one to think about in cattle is that if their mother has produced some good first milk called colostrum for the calf, it contains a high level of what we call antibodies. And antibodies are a specific thing we'll talk about in a minute further that can protect the young calf. And then this is excellent when it comes to botulism because it can protect the calf um, not forever though, and so the calf can typically get about four to eight months protection against botulism, so it will survive exposure to certain dosages of poisoning. Now you can also develop some antibodies against disease if you get exposed to disease and then you survive. So for example, people who have been exposed to coronavirus um, and they've survived, they will have very, very high levels of what we call antibody, and it means that they can go out into the community and they're protected against that disease. The problem is, is that not everyone will survive. 
And then we can also um, give vaccines which will trick the body and we will get some antibodies without ever having had the disease. So when it comes to botulism, unfortunately, natural exposure to the toxin is once again too fast. The animal's going to die before it can make protective antibodies. And that's why this is an example of a disease where we really need vaccination to give rapid and then long lasting protection without having the risk of exposure exactly what we need for coronavirus as well right now. So just to understand what antibodies are, they're just a protein in our body that we make and they're made by specific parts of our body called white blood cells and they're used to neutralise specific germs and toxins. So unlike the first stage that I said where you just had them killing germs without knowing what they are, antibodies are specific to each germ or toxin. And a good way of explaining them is that antibodies can hold the invading germ or toxin so other immune cells can destroy them. Just like someone might hold down someone in a pub who's mucking up so that that problem can be dealt with. Now antibodies are visualized by looking a bit like this. They look like little Y-shaped things and those arms are what holds the toxin or the germ. And so when we vaccinate cattle against botulism, we're trying to make more of these little things that can stimulate the production um, of the defence against the disease. And those little arms up the top will be able to hold the botulism toxin so it can be destroyed. Now, another thing that is useful to understand before we talk about vaccines is a term we call antigen. Now, antigens are the little tiny parts of bacteria, viruses or toxins or what we put in vaccines that stimulate the body to make an immune response. So that's what we do with vaccination is we trick the immune system by just taking these little things called antigens and we don't cause the animal harm, but we trick the body to respond and make antibodies. And by that exposure, we can protect the animal. Now, don't worry if that was a bit of detail because this picture makes it really come together to understand what I was talking about. So when we vaccinate cattle, and the syringe there is going under the skin and the little red dots in there are antigen. So pretend that that is say botulism toxin. Um, and to make that, what we've done in a factory is we've damaged the toxin so it can't harm the animal, but it still is like the toxin, so it tricks the body. That goes under the skin and these big blue cells, um, which are those first line of defense, they grab that little antigen, the red dots in this picture, and they say, this is foreign, we shouldn't have this, and they take it to the lymph nodes. Now, lymph nodes, if you've ever had the flu and you feel those lumps in your neck, well, that was lymph nodes. So lymph nodes make the antibodies. So you can see in this picture that the red little dots are stimulating things in the lymph nodes to make those antibodies. Those antibodies can neutralise botulism toxin that is in the body then and also in the future. Now, the reason that it works in the future is because of these things that are in purple there called memory cells. Now, some vaccines can stimulate memory cells for longer than others, and this leads to the claim of the vaccine. So, for example, in botulism, we have annual vaccines and we also have three-year vaccine. So, I'll just pass back to you, David, for a little break from my voice. Yep, no worries. So just before we continue on with the presentation, I'll just ask two more questions, um, which will lead on to the next part of the presentation. So just launching that now. So which of the following botulism vaccines are you currently using for your wieners? Select as many that apply. All right, a couple more seconds. All right, I'll just close that off now. So I'll just share the results. So for the wieners, we've got a high majority using Singback one year, 29% um, using Singback three year, 21% using long range, um, and 7% using Ultravac um, botulinum. All right, and the last poll question, Which of the following botulism vaccines are you currently using for your adult breeders? All 
All right, a couple more seconds. All right, and just closing that off. Um, I'd like to share again. So for the adult breeders, 42% um, are using three year, 25% are using one year, 17% using long range, and 17% uh, using ultraback. All right, to you, Matt. So just before our poll break, I was showing a picture that gave an idea of how vaccines work. A lot of us um, tend to think about vaccines working like this, that when we give the vaccine to the cattle, they'll all have equal amounts of protection. So in this picture, we've got the red cows and in each of them, there's a diagram as though how many antibodies they have and all these cattle have the same amount of antibody. So we assume when we vaccinate children, cows or dogs, that we put the vaccines under the skin and every animal or person responds the same. The reality is that what usually happens is that we're all individuals and all cattle are different as well and we respond differently to a vaccine. And it depends on lots of factors around genetics, nutrition, how stressed you were at the time you were given your vaccine, the same applies for cattle. And so you can see in this picture that we've got one cow in the middle that's responded really, really well, is gonna have really high amounts of antibodies. The one next to it didn't respond at all to the vaccine. And then there's other ones um, that are less. So an important take home message from tonight is to always think about what things we can do to eat to improve that. And that involves addressing um, nutritional concerns, um, the way we use vaccines, the type of vaccines we use, can try to improve the way that we protect our animals against disease. And the same principles apply what doctors think about for protecting us. So how do we have any idea as to whether cattle are protected or not? Well, we can take blood samples from the tail of cattle. And there's a picture of me here um, taking some blood samples from cattle. And we can send them off to a laboratory. There's only one laboratory in Australia that can do this, and it's the government laboratory in Western Australia. And um, in the middle is a laboratory report that I've received from this many years ago. And you can see on the far right hand column, I just want to um, introduce a concept here that these are antibody titers. Um, this is kind of a level of protection you can measure in the blood. You can see that all these cattle were positive and all these cattle had been given a Singback vaccine at some time earlier that year. Now, um, it's a bit arbitrary and complex, but a simple way of explaining this is that if cattle achieve above 0.45 in that uh, numbers on the right hand side, we assume that they're probably going to be protected against a certain botulism challenge. So you can see that these cattle all had high readings and above that type of level. So scientists like to do work um, to understand you know, are cattle actually achieving what status of antibodies they should? And I want to show you a paper from overseas that some scientists did some work testing antibody levels of cattle in the face of outbreaks of botulism. And I think that there are some important things to learn here. The first bullet point is fairly straightforward in that it says that 96% of unvaccinated cattle had not reached the protective antibody level of say 0.45. So this is cattle that were adult cattle in this case, and they had not reached their protective level. Not surprising, they haven't been vaccinated. Interestingly, and we talked about this, 76% of calves that were between two to six months of age hadn't had a vaccine yet, but they were protective. So that's because their mothers had given them protective antibodies. Unfortunately, not all calves, but still a pretty high number. Now, one of the major take homes from tonight is to understand that it's really difficult to vaccinate young animals well in almost all species and particularly in cattle that are in extensive pastoral regions. These scientists found in their research that 40% of heifers that had been given a vaccine had not actually reached a protective level. So out of every 100 heifers vaccinated, 40 of them were not actually considered protected. If we look at older age groups in the herd, they found that it improved. So we had 14% of second calvers that were not protected. And then by the time you get to third calvers, almost every animal in the herd in that age group was protected. Um, in that case, it was almost 95%. So one of the things that these scientists talk about in the discussion is that we need to improve vaccination protocols against diseases like botulism, but we need to especially focus on our young animals. 
Now, some people would say, well, you know, do we need to get more antibody levels? Um, is an animal that is on a botulism antibody level of 0 0.45, is that as good as an animal that is on one? Are they both protected? We do know that for a disease like botulism, we call it a dose-related disease, which means that the higher you can make those antibody levels, we assume the more that cattle can survive a high dose toxin. And the analogy that I discuss about this is that even if you have a protected window or a bulletproof window, a big enough projectile or a big enough rock will be able to smash through that. And for what we know from botulism outbreaks, even in some vaccinated cattle, if their titers are too low, they may not be able to survive a high toxin load. So the take home message is it is important to have high antibody levels in your herd. Now, I was involved in some research with the Northern Territory DPI. Um, I met the veterinarian that was based in Catherine and we shared stories about botulism. And we decided that we'd like to answer some questions about why we sometimes saw botulism outbreaks in vaccinated herds. And we realized that it was necessary for the government veterinarian to take blood samples from stations for blue tongue surveillance. And so we decided, well, why not ask for permission from the pastoralists if we could send off samples to test for botulism antibodies? And that's what we did on 17 stations. We took 30 bloods and all of these bloods came from young females that had been given a botulism vaccine within the previous 12 months. Um, it was based on whatever protocol the station had been using. And what's important is we didn't give the vaccines, we just took the bloods and we're just finding out, we call that a survey, how protected are these cattle that have been vaccinated um, once or twice in their lives. Probably actually was only once in, in all cases. And then those bloods were sent off to that laboratory in Western Australia to check their results. Now, our findings when it was analysed by a scientist based at the University of New England was that we actually had 33% of those young animals in the Northern Territory not protected. Now, it's important to emphasise that this is young animals because if we do this type of research in adult cows, we will get much, much better results. These young animals, um, similar to in people, can be hard to protect well against disease. Some of the factors why we only managed to pick up that farmers were managing to protect 67% of their young stock could be that some of the animals actually weren't vaccinated because um, in the Northern Territory, they may have not been brought in at the muster the first time and we weren't blood sampling exactly the same animals. We were just testing the herd and so maybe some of them had never been vaccinated, but probably not a major factor in this case. We know that any form of stress will lead to an elevation of a hormone called cortisol. So if weaners are very stressed around vaccination, you will get a lower immune response. That could be part of the puzzle. We know that if you're under nutritional stress, um, these animals could be transitioning from a milk-based diet to less. Their protein levels may be declining. This may mean that they can't respond as well to a vaccine. We just know that they're young and it's harder for them to mount a good immune response sometimes. A really important one that we can all control is that there can be a factor that the vaccines may not have been handled properly, which means that they were made to be getting too hot. Um, the vaccines are a little bit forgiving. You can take them out of eskies and use them for a while, but if these vaccines have been heavily exposed to light or have been out of a cool temperature for a very long time, it can be damaging. But probably more important is that when we went back and had some conversations with some of the managers on these stations, it became obvious that sometimes cattle are just not being vaccinated properly. And it can be that the job is one of many that needs to be done. Ringers have a lot of cattle to get through and there can be vaccine that is sometimes sprayed on the race or actually just not getting under the skin. Now we know this because we have done testing when We've had heavily supervised vaccination compared to unsupervised vaccination, and we've had better results when vaccination was supervised. So what I say is just spend a little bit more time to save cattle lives, even if it's only a few more seconds per animal. In some other research that I was involved in, we looked at some cattle in the Kimberley that the weaners were being placed on feed prior to um, their vaccination. So they were being yard weaned. They weren't being given their animal health treatment straight away. 
and we'll be able to compare this to cattle that were given their vaccine on the very day they were taken off from their mothers, they'd been mustered by helicopters, brought into yards, put through processing shoots, given a vaccine. And the difference is seen in these yellow and, and green graphs in that the cattle that had been given a bit more time to relax on feed, they got used to the facilities, they hadn't just been mustered in, they got higher immune response to the ones that were vaccinated immediately um, on that day of actual weaning. Both cattle managed to achieve protective levels from the vaccine, but it's important that the cattle that were socialised non-feed in a yard got better levels, and that certainly may be therefore a more ideal way to consider it if we can. Now I want to introduce a term that's important to understand about different vaccines, and it's a term called adjuvant. Now the best vaccines that we have to stimulate immunity are called live vaccines. So in cattle, an example of that is the tick fever vaccine. These vaccines actually replicate in the body, they're live and they produce really, really good immunity. There's one problem, we can't do that for every disease because it's too dangerous for some. And also sometimes the product would be too fragile so it would be useless by the time you used it in the field. So therefore we have to use most of the time what are called inactivated vaccines. And these need what are called an adjuvant to work. So what I mean by inactivated vaccine is that all botulism vaccines have had the toxin, it's been damaged by formalin, it's not actually active, um, and therefore it doesn't stimulate the body as well. Now you need to add an adjuvant to these type of vaccines for them to work well. Historically, most vaccines have had aluminium hydroxide added. In human and animal vaccines, some of them have a water oil formulation and emulsion, and this is typically used when we need a stronger type of immunity from a single injection. Now, if you think back to that picture I showed about those little red dots going under the skin when we gave the vaccine, what adjuvants do is they delay those little red dots under the skin so the body cannot process them too quickly and remove them. Because if they get removed too quickly, we don't stimulate good solid immunity that will last for a long time. So that's what adjuvants do, is they actually attempt to keep the little antigen there for longer. Now, scientists are very interested in this type of idea for human health and very topical for the moment is that most of us are being encouraged to have flu vaccines because it's considered really bad if you get exposed to coronavirus and also seasonal flu. Now, these Australian scientists had a look at the challenge of vaccinating children against seasonal influenza and their findings were summarised that it was difficult to get adequate immunity using typical water-based vaccine, whereas they were able to get much more solid and prolonged immunity if they used an oil and water emulsion. And so interestingly, this year most of you will be given one of two flu vaccines. Um, I've been given so a Afluria Quad. Now this is a four, it contains four types of seasonal flu antigens, but it's in a more traditional type base. Um, Fluad Quad, I'm not eligible for that because it's only for people who are above 65. And this contains a oil in water emulsion, MF59, and will stimulate a much stronger immunity. We are not given that vaccine, all of us, for economic reasons, because I assume that to Medicare, a flu ad costs about $60 to the government and an effluria probably costs about $20. Now, some of these issues are being looked at in animal health. And unfortunately, using our botulism vaccines that were probably invented in the 1970s, our water-based vaccines. So in Australia, this is brand names like Webster's CND and Ultravax CND. When you actually study the antibody responses in the cattle, they don't really reliably protect cattle for more than six months. Now, that's probably not really surprising. Um, some of these vaccines we've assumed in far north Australia that, oh, that's probably okay because they're bumping into some natural exposure and it kind of ticks over. But these scientists have challenged that um, and showing that cattle in um, field conditions given these vaccine, according to label instructions, was probably only protected for about six months. Now, the gold standard way to check how vaccines are working is called a challenge study, which has been done in Australia. The problem is, is that this is not considered particularly good for animal welfare because 
some of the cattle that are given botulism toxin will not survive. But this study has been done in Australia, at least in a small group of cattle. And this is studying, uh, this is a summary of some scientists' work where they were approved to test 15 cattle in three groups given three different types of vaccines. Each vaccine had a different form of adjuvant in it. So I'll just talk you through what happened here. So five of the cattle were vaccinated with a traditional aluminium-based vaccine, um, which these days would be like Ultravax CND or Webster CND. Out of the cattle, all five cattle showed symptoms um, and two of those cattle went on to die and three recovered. So none of the cattle were unaffected. At that time, which is going back quite a long time because you wouldn't be approved to do this research these days, they also gave an aqueous-based vaccine of which the registered vaccine they used at that time is no longer registered. It was an early form of the vaccine registered now um, called long range. And with that formulation, we found that um, you, get, you got three cattle that became affected of which one went on to die and two were very sick and then had some form of recovery. Um, and then you had two cattle that were unaffected. The scientists gave five of the cattle a water in oil in water emulsion vaccine and none of the cattle became sick, therefore none of them died um, and it was by far the most protective vaccine. Now this study challenged a little bit the concept that cattle can be protected by just natural exposure because all of these cattle were collected from farms in Northern Australia um, and their conclusion was that traditional vaccines, especially an aluminium based vaccine, can't be relied upon to have high antibody titers, whereas a water and oil based vaccine can provide high antibody titers irrelevant of whether they've been exposed to the disease or not at some time in their life. So I just want to summarise um, what those scientists found with antibody levels. The red line coming on the screen here is the type of antibodies achieved in cattle with no vaccine. So this is just natural exposure throughout one year. So these graphs are going over one year. The next line appearing in yellow is if a vaccine, a traditional one such as Ultravax CND or Webster CND was given just once. That's the yellow line. The next line, the blue line, was if an aqueous one-shot vaccine was used. The next line, which is starting to look very impressive and be quite higher levels, is if you boosted your Ultravax CND or your Webster CND, as it says on label, four to six later. So you can see the titus went up really nice and high. The problem with the technology in those vaccines was it was starting to decline quite quickly by the 30 week mark. So similar to what those scientists were saying at six months. And then if we use a vaccine that contains a water in oil emulsion, which in this case was Singvac-1, we can see that we not only achieved extremely high vaccine titers, but they could last right through until an annual booster um, for that product a year later. So how can the adjuvants in human flu vaccines or in animal botulism vaccines, how can this difference occur? What occurs is if you look at a traditional vaccine, which is on the right, the little vaccine bottle there, you just have the antigens floating in a watery type solution. And when that's injected under the skin, the body grabs those little antigens, responds to it as well as it can, and it certainly does boost the antibody levels. In the newer technology, which is a water oil type emulsion, you'll notice that the little blue dots, the antigens, are hidden within water droplets, which are then within oil droplets. Now, why is it designed like this? Well, initially, when you put the vaccines under the skin or into the arm of the person, you get an initial immune response to the antigens that are just in a water stage of the product. And that is the same as any other vaccine. But you then gradually over time, the little blue antigens have been hidden and it stimulates a prolonged immunity because it takes time until the body is exposed to them. And you end up with a much, much higher antibody response and more prolonged because you've delayed the process as that little picture is showing the body taking a two-stage approach to become immune. So when we looked at this issue um, in the work that we did combined with the Blue Tongue surveillance in the Northern Territory, we were able to ask the farmers, what type of vaccine did you use in the last 12 months? 
And we were able to confirm that if the young cattle had had a water and oil emulsion vaccine, there was more chance that the young cattle had reached protective antibodies. So there was a 23% difference between an aqueous vaccine and a water and oil emulsion vaccine um, as a very statistically significant finding. And then if we looked um, based on the farmers' reports of what vaccine they'd used, the antibody titers were much higher with Singvac. Now, the researcher based at the University of New England said, well, you guys did this research without any supervision of the vaccines and you've just done a survey. You've just gone out and taken bloods. What you really should do to check these findings is you should get groups of cattle, divide them in half randomly and give an aqueous vaccine and a water and oil emulsion to half each. And that's what we did. We set up three trial sites and these are the summary of these results where we, we were able to supervise the use of the vaccines and then check how young cattle went. Now to talk you through what this graph is showing, the gray bars is the levels of antibodies being achieved without any vaccination. So these are calves that have had milk from their mothers, they've been weaned and so they've still got a little bit of protection, but the black dotted line is where we want them to at least cross over and they're nowhere near there. With our aqueous vaccine, you can see that for the two types of botulism, the yellow bar graph, we're able to get over the line, but not a long way over. And then with the water and oil-based emulsion in the Singvac vaccine, was able to get them higher above that line and some higher titers for their first ever vaccine in life. So when that work was analysed, um, we're able to summarise that a water and oil based vaccine, the Singback brand, was able to protect 26% more of those young animals against type C and 15% more against type D. What I want to have a look at now is beyond any brand names or marketing to do with vaccines, what's available for you to buy and then what are some conclusions from research we can safely make? So in Australia, pastoralists can choose to buy these type of vaccines. You can buy aluminium adjuvant two-shot vaccine. So you have to give young cattle two vaccines four to six weeks apart, and this is Ultravax CND or Webster CND. You can also buy an aqueous one-shot vaccine, which in Australia um, we have an example long range. You can buy a water in oil in water emulsion one-shot vaccine that's been formulated to give one-year protection, Singback 1. And you can also buy a water and oil in water vaccine formulated to give three years protection in Singback 3. So what are some conclusions we can come to? First of all, it's important to emphasise it is never adequate to use number one type of vaccines, um, which are two-shot vaccines just once. Um, so this means in young animals, just giving them one of these and assuming that that will be adequate. Also, that would apply if an animal has not been vaccinated for a long time to give one of these is not going to be adequate. We can also know that both the aluminium, the number one there, and number two vaccines, there is research suggesting that these type of formulations may only provide six months protection on some properties, and we definitely will have lower antibody levels than water in oil in water vaccines. So that leads to conclusions in some of the scientific work that we should be considering that for animals that are more prone to immunosuppression, just like elderly people or very young children, that they need a water and oil in water adjuvanted vaccine for their primary, so their first vaccinations, and then their next time they're exposed to the vaccine at the very least. So this is your weaners and your initial boosters really deserve that type of vaccine because we've got evidence the other types may not do as good a job. We also talked about that it's very important in young animals to try to get them nutritionally ready for their vaccination, not have them stressed and take as the little bit of extra time to make sure we do this job properly and that way we'll also improve our results. Now Verbac is an Australian manufacturer of botulism vaccine who has sponsored tonight's webinar. So I just want to explain their programs quickly. The programs that we're most proud of, we call our three shots for life programs because compared to having to give lots of vaccines, you can simply give three shots for the typical life of a Northern Australian animal. Probably our best practice program is to initially give young animals a Singvac one year and then follow that up a year later with a Singvac three year and then we can just give one more vaccine. The reason that we prefer you to use the one year first is simply because 
if you have a high rate of missed musters, you might not get all those weaners in, or if your weaners were under significant stress, you may need the vaccine the next year in order to boost that. But in many situations, um, people use, as is up on the screen now, a Singback three year as their three shot for life program. Some people also have heard the type of information we're talking about and they stick with just using Singback three year, but they move that second one in the program a bit earlier in life just to try and mop up in case they had some missed muster there. Now, if a three year vaccine um, doesn't suit you, um, then an annual program, your best practice would be to stick with your better quality vaccine, your water and oil adjuvant vaccine each year. So that's a Singback one. So there's an annual program. From what we understand in people and animals, you can consider in some enterprises that as long as you do a proper job with your upfront getting in a water and oil vaccine when they're more immunocompromised, you may be able to boost that with a traditional vaccine after that, which in this case is showing two Singbacks and then a Webster's booster. But definitely giving a Singback every year will maintain a higher level of protection across your herd. Now, I'm almost out of time. I just wanted to make a quick comment that it's not always practical to protect Northern Australian cattle against clostridial disease, but I noticed that a lot of people tonight are using these vaccines, seven in one and five in one. In Northern Australia, we certainly do have leptospirosis um, and also we do have tetanus. It's hard to protect them because these are two-shot vaccines, but as much as possible, please consider their use in your adult cows when you see them, so they produce good quality milk for the calves, and you can certainly roll out these vaccines at calf marking. Other vaccines I typically advise might be only needed on advice from your veterinarian, although generally vibriosis is needed in, your, in every bull. Furback is proud to make the Webster's range here in Australia, so certainly that's something to consider for your five in one and seven in one needs. So thank you very much tonight for listening. I think hopefully we've got a little bit of time for questions tonight. Yep, thanks Matt for that informative presentation. Um, so we actually do have a couple of questions. Um, so the first one, uh, Matt, um, do you think one vaccination of tetanus will do anything or do we need those two um, vaccinations? This is a really good question because we know that tetanus probably causes the deaths of some calves after marking, but um, just like botulism managed to invent one shots, we haven't been able to do that for tetanus. So everyone always wonders, well, what happens if I just give one? Is it doing something? Is it better than doing nothing? It probably is. There has been some research which was done by this um, not that long ago. And the research looked at just comparing the muster rates if you did or didn't use one shot. And in that research, it didn't actually find a different rate of the number of animals brought in. But then it wasn't directly uh, proving whether or not the animals were exposed to any tetanus, etc. Personally, I believe that it is useful to give tetanus protection as a booster to the cow, so they will then pass it on to their calves and the milk. And these are inexpensive products. You may as well give a five-in-one booster to a calf at marking because the value of its life is worth it if that's going to protect it. So we actually, unfortunately, don't have any information to suggest that one is enough but I personally would do it. Thanks, Matt. Um, another question we have is, if we correct um, phosphorus practice and supplement with phosphorus, do we still then need to vaccinate against botulism? We do need to still vaccinate because um, we know that cattle still will display pica and chewing behaviour, eating bones, et cetera, when we correct phosphorus. It's a learnt behaviour and so, the risk of botulism remains. Thank you. And I'll just leave this at, as the final question. Um, does it matter if we keep the vaccine, the botulism vaccine, um, out of the esky while vaccinating, or is there some best practice ways to ensure, um, I guess, effectiveness of the vaccine? So per the label of the vaccines, they should be kept at two to eight degrees. And certainly from when they're produced in the factory and then they're delivered to stores and then in fridges in the stores, that is true. Um, those vaccines need to be kept at two to eight degrees when you transport them home. So please bring an esky or something to the store if you're picking it up yourself. Um, and then at home until you use them, they need to be kept at that. 
you take an ESCII to the yards. Now, what everyone really wants to know is they are not going to just totally stop working if you have that vaccine out for a while to vaccinate the cattle, um, you know, a couple of hundred head probably. We don't like them to be exposed to light. So pick up um, most vaccine manufacturers, including Verbac, can supply you something to protect the outside of it. Um, that stops the light damaging it. Um, if you're having a break, please put it back in an ESCII because it will look after it. Please also mix the vaccine. If you see, you can actually shake these vaccines quite vigorously. If you see a bit of settling out, make sure you shake it to work well. Try to keep it cool if you can, but these are not live vaccines. There's some robustness to them um, once you are just about to use it. But of course, if the vaccine has been kept out of the fridge for the day at the yards, you can't reuse that and just expect it to be as good, but it's forgiving while you're using it. I hope that, that gives people some practical advice. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so unfortunately, it's time to wrap up the webinar. Um, if we weren't able to get to your question tonight, please don't worry. I will follow up with anyone who still has outstanding questions. Uh, I'd just like to offer a quick thanks to Dr. Matt again for his presentation tonight, um, but most importantly, a sincere thanks for everyone attending. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know, Matt, if you could switch to the next slide, um, that we will be having our second part of this webinar series occurring on Wednesday, the 22nd of April, so that's next week, um, which will be looking into nutrition and supplementation considerations for Northern Beef Enterprises. Um, so, Matt, on the next slide, um, you'll also see topics will include um, so key nutritional concerns for northern beef operations, uh, phosphorus uh, considerations for improved productivity and fertility, uh, a talk about trace minerals and how it improves productivity and fertility, and also a bit about high impact supplementation. So what supplements are offer more bang for your buck. Um, so we will be joined by two guest speakers, um, Tim Schatz, who is the Principal Livestock Research Officer from the Northern Territory Department of Primary Industry and Resources, as well as Dr. Paula Gonzalez, the Technical Services Manager for Nutrition at Verbac Australia. So if you'd like to be a part of this webinar, tomorrow you'll receive an email with the link for you to uh, sign up and register. Finally, to help us improve our information delivery, there's a quick 30 second survey at the conclusion of this webinar um, where you can let us know um, of any future topics um, you also want us to discuss. So thank you everyone again for attending. I uh, hope you have a, all, have a great night. Um, stay safe and we hope to see you again at the next webinar. Thank you.